few things here. Sorry, I, I apologize about Tuesday. I, uh, um, I had a sub lined up, but his wife got really sick, and so... Do you? No, you don't. Um, Twice the number today. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. But, um, well, what that means is less material on your exam next week. So, um, so there you go, right? So there's a compromise. There's a, and we can compromise a little bit. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's, let's just chat for a second here. Um, so I have your, your homework from before. I'll pass back to the end of class today. So this assignment you will get back on Tuesday. So you'll have everything before the exam. I still plan on doing the exam next Thursday, even though we won't have covered a whole lot. Um, but that just means you can focus more on some of these sections. And I, I think maybe you noticed this homework was maybe a little more difficult than some of the other ones. Um, so you can focus on that without getting overloaded with a bunch more sections. So I think this is actually going to work out okay. Um, so that, again, the, the exam will be next Thursday. Same, you know, very similar kind of format. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm not going to to put, you know, the most difficult problems on the on the exam, but I do, I am going to test to see that you have some understanding of what's going on. And, and part of that will include a couple of proofs for sure, but they're not going to be the hardest possible proofs. Um, but you, you, yeah. Does it also include then, like, application of these theories to, like, compute something? Or? Oh, so computing things? Because, um, I mean, those are questions in the book, but we never get assigned them. Right. Um, so the you know the the kind of questions you you would you would see would be these these are things that you should be prepared to do from the homework that I've given you, okay. So um, let's see. Aside from that, here's another thing I'll tell you. Um, what I'm going to do is, and this will give you some incentive to kind of keep up with things. And I'm doing this mainly just because we haven't done a whole lot and we had we didn't have class on Tuesday. I'm going to put one problem on the exam directly off of the last exam, okay. Mm -hmm. So look over the solutions, okay? I want to keep you guys up to speed because, you know, this is going to be helpful for you on the final. Plus, induction, GCD, all that stuff, it just keeps coming up over and over again. So it's, it's really important to have that down, okay? And when I say that, I mean verbatim. I'm, I'm not changing anything. So just all you have to do is make sure that you look over the solutions. They're all online, okay? So there's one freebie right away, okay? So do that. Definitely do that. Um, and uh, let's see, other than that... I, I don't think there's anything else I wanted to say. Um, we're going to talk about one more section today. Um, I'm going to give you one more assignment. This assignment I think you'll find is actually uh, easier than the last assignment is going to, was, I should say. Um, and the, uh, just like with the last exam, the assignment uh, that I'm going to give you will be due at the exam, so you have a week to work on it. Tuesday when we re review, I'll talk about a couple of the problems and such to, you know, to help you out with that. Yes. Yes, it will be. Mm -hmm. It's a week, though. It's a week. You got, yeah. I mean, everything keeps getting pushed back. In the 60s, you could have something new covered and test it on it the next day. In 2050, oh, you can't, you can't put anything on the exam that was covered, you know, any, any uh, more than three months before the test. You know, now a week is a reasonable amount of time. Okay, it is. Um, okay, so what did I want to say? There was one other thing. <laughs> My debt? No. <laughs> I was not in school in the 60s. I was not born in the 60s. My, my, uh, my dad was in school in the 60s, and he told me all these things. Things were... Things were uh, um, no, no, I, I... Hang on a second here. Let me get this back again. Sorry. Okay. So I just clicked this once now, right? Isn't that... A, okay. One time... I don't need to go to this second option here. And I, okay. Let's see. Or do I? Well, because now it's not. There we go. Now that's not right, though, is it? Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. Did I want, did I want to? Yeah, okay. Well, let's see. I'll, yeah, this is the one I think I had before. Was that? Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, three point. Two. Okay. And you'll actually be glad to know that a lot of this you've already done. If you, those of you that took discrete, which is most of you, um, maybe all of you at this point, those that didn't take it dropped out a while ago, I think. But um, so you've you've probably you've probably seen this before. Um, this is going to sound really Where's your complicated. <laughs> you made me self-conscious. You made me self-conscious today. 
And so I left it in my office. Yeah. It was black. No, not at all. No, my no, I uh my my well my my girlfriend has changed my, my wardrobe completely now. So I didn't I didn't used to you know uh not exactly. I mean she's bought me a lot of stuff, you know. But she doesn't literally put the clothes on me. No, that does not happen. Um I would I'll, no, I don't have a. I don't have a. I have no complex I about this. Preterm labor. <laughs> uh, I got to be careful what I say because she could. She could watch these these lectures too. Not that she would watch. She's she's not that bored, but she could see this. So I got to be careful what I say. Okay. Um, we'll see about that. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, we're going to look at a few questions here. Sorry, this is a little screwed up here. Um, but this, this is called the sieve of Eratosthenes. And uh, it's actually, the section is, this is only a, about one-fifth of the section. This is, in fact, you, probably, you, might have learned, you literally might have learned this in third grade. It's, it's actually possible you learned this in third grade. Um, so here are the questions that we're going to be looking at. So the first one, and most of you probably already know the answer to this. Four. Uh, no. No. Okay. All right. How many primes are there? Okay. You, you've probably seen this before. Most of you probably know this, right? Infinitely many. We're going to talk about this today. Probably you did this in discrete uh, at some point, I'm guessing. Okay. Um, something that's a little harder is uh, the following. What does their distribution look like? Uh, it has something to do with that. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that in here. Um, uh, well, so there's yeah, there's there's something called the the Riemann hypothesis, and it has to do with solutions to these certain called zeta functions. But we're not we're not going to go into any of that stuff in here. Uh, no, trust me, that is not that's not fun. Um, <laughs> You do. That's that's true. We yeah. Work on it uh, if we all worked on it for the rest of our lives, there's no chance that we would solve it. Um, <laughs> I, no, that, that's that is the that is the well, truth. Have you tried this before? No. Well, people have people have worked on this for for a long time, and it's very 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 hard. Okay. Yeah. It's no. It's crap. Um, it's a little, it's a little tricky. Um, okay. And then the last question is, uh, how can one determine if a given um, natural number is prime? Right. These are very general questions. And so we're going to look at a few of these today. And uh, I'm just going to kind of, this is going to be maybe a little more informal than normal, but I'm just going to start this way and just say, here are some answers. Um, these answers are not the best answers. These are kind of weak answers, but uh, at least gives you some ideas to, you know, um, just kind of an introduction to, to how, how, you know, some of these questions might be solved. Okay, so the first, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, even though that's the title of this section, but uh, yeah, I don't like writing this. This is a very long word. Okay. Um, that's what I'm going to do. That's exactly what I was going to do, actually. The S of E, yes. That is very, very nice. Okay, so... Um, here's the, the idea is, um, I'll just put this kind of parenthetically here. The idea is to, um, roughly just, you know, find the primes, um, which, you know, inside of 
the natural numbers. Okay. How did you say that word again? Which? Eratosthenes. Yeah. Or if this is, I guess it's the pronunciation is sieve, although maybe some people would say sieve. But uh, everybody in the states, this is I don't understand this, but everybody in the states that calls a picture says pitcher. How many of you say pitcher for picture? Probably a lot of you do. No, not everybody does that. Okay, okay it's a Colorado thing. I don't know. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's I never heard that before. I never heard that before I moved here. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, pitcher exactly. A beer, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So this is really simplistic. It's all it's so simplistic that it's almost kind of silly that there's a name for this. Like it's some big famous brilliant idea, but it's really not at all. Um okay, so of course we can't, you know, we can't actually write all of these down, but um we'll just write down some of them so you can see how this goes. Uh yeah, although that's not that's not really going to help us here, but um okay, so I'm just going to go up to 20. There we go. Okay. Um, and here's what you do. You, so you, you basically just want to see which ones, have, so the point is what, which numbers are prime. And of course you can, you know, you probably just know off the top of your head what, what they are. But suppose we were to go up to, you know, 500 or something like that. Well, there's a nice simple sort of algorithm that you could teach a very young child to, to, um, to run through and be able to actually figure out what the primes are. And so here's the, here's the, uh, the algorithm. Um, <coughs> clearly, right, two is definitely prime. So we're going to, I'm adding something to this a little bit. So we're going to circle number two. Okay. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to cross out all, uh, I'm running out of room here, so all x bigger than 2, uh, which are divisible by 2. In other words, the even integer is bigger than 2. Okay, so that's easy, right? We're going to cross out 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, on down. Okay. Well, okay, hang on a second. So the idea is that um, these are not prime, of course, because they have a factor of 2. 2 is prime, you know, it also has a factor of 2, but there's no other factor right between one and itself. So since these other guys that we crossed out all have a factor of two and they're all bigger than two, there's a factor that's not equal to one in itself. So they're not prime, right? Um, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to go, um, uh, let me say it a better way, sorry. I don't, don't want to say it this way. So circle the... Um, next, or if you want to say first, um, integer, which isn't crossed out. Right. And of course, in this case, it's the number three. All right. And again, three's prime. Of course, it's not divisible by 2. If it was, we would have crossed it out. Um, so it has no factors other than 1 in itself. Of course, this is obvious. 
And then what we're going to do, I was going to write more down than this, but you know, you, you folks are all smart and you, you, I don't think you need me to. Um, we're just going to repeat this, this process and um, this will generate the list of primes. Okay? And so let's just go ahead and do this. I'll, I'll wait till you have this written down, but if you pay attention to this, this is going to be very easy. You could all reproduce this easily. Um, I don't think there's going to be any issue with this. So, okay. So when I say repeat the process, so what did we do before? We, we circled two, then we crossed out all the ones bigger than two that were divisible by two. So now we circled three, so we're going to cross out all of the integers bigger than three that are divisible by three. Okay, so the first one we come to is six. Well, that's already crossed out, so we don't need to do it again. It's already gone. Okay, so imagine the number being crossed out. It's just kind of erased. I mean, you sort of think of it that way, because we're interested in finding the primes. Okay, so what's the next one? Nine, right? So we're going to cross this out. Twelve's already crossed out. Fifteen, we're going to cross that out. 18 is already crossed out and we're stopping at 20 now, so this takes care of all of them. Okay, so what's the next number that's not crossed out? It's 5, right? So we're going to circle that. That one's prime. And we're going to cross out all the ones bigger than 5 that are divisible by 5. So 10, which was already crossed out in the beginning because it's even. 15 is crossed out because it's divisible by 3. 20 is crossed out, of course, because it's even. Of course, if we were to continue to go you know, down the list, um, we, would, we would get to 25, and 25 would be not crossed out. We would actually have to cross that one out because 25 is not divisible by 2 or 3. Okay, so now we just keep doing this. So, okay, so the next one, 7, circle that. Okay, so again, because this list is really small, the only other number that's divisible by 7 that's bigger than 7 on this list is 14, which is crossed out in the beginning because it's even. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, there is a statement in the book about using the square root. Yeah, so that's, like yeah. Prime, mm -hmm. Couldn't we just say that the rest are prime now? Well, we yeah, so that, that is, we're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah, I just haven't talked about it yet. But yes, that is correct. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, so then, now notice this, though. This is kind of interesting, I, I suppose. Um, now we come to 11. Well, what else do we have to cross out? Well, there's nothing left because... 20, uh, 22 is the first one bigger than 11 that's divisible by 11. It's not on the list. So everything else that we've got left over, we automatically know are, these are primes, right? Okay. So 11, 13, 17, and 19. Okay. okay. Does this make sense, this idea? Okay. So... Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this other than to say that the ones that we have circled are, in fact, primes. Uh, I'm not going to try to write a proof of this. I think this is probably pretty, pretty self-explanatory. But you might say, well, how do you know, for example, that you know, one of these numbers that were circled uh, isn't divisible by one of the numbers that were crossed out before? Okay, so why is that? Well, of course, this is a really small list here. But, you know, for example... Um, I mean, you know 17 is prime, but, but how do you know that maybe it was divisible by one of these guys that was already crossed out and it's not actually prime? You know, 17 is a small number, but what if you get to 509 or something like that, right? Well, the answer is 17 can't be divisible by any of the numbers that were crossed out because the numbers that were crossed out were crossed out because they were divisible by something. So whatever that thing is that divides the number that was crossed out, that number that was crossed out can't divide the number that was circled because then the original thing would divide it too, okay? There's a theorem that says if A divides B and B divides C, this transitive property, then A divides C. Okay, so a number that was crossed out can't divide one of these guys because it was crossed out because it was divisible by something, and that thing would have to divide this new guy too. Okay, and so um, that's roughly the idea behind it. Okay, and, and just by the algorithm, every time you circle a number, you automatically cross out everything else bigger than it that, that, that it divides. So those are all gone. Okay, so if it can't be divisible by one of these circled numbers because it would be already crossed out, and it can't be divisible by one of these crossed out numbers because it would have been divisible by one of the circled numbers. So it does generate the list of primes. It does work. Yeah? This may be a moot point, but as an algorithm, that seems flawed, because if you're doing it on a whole set of natural numbers, you won't get a 3 because you'll be crossing out even numbers for the rest of your life. Oh, well, you can't. You couldn't. I mean, this isn't something that's uh, feasible to do in practice anyways, though. I mean, you, you would never finish. I mean, you, you could, you know, you, you could. I was thinking of, like, computer algorithms. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Well. Yeah, I mean, no, you can, I mean, certainly um, you can generate, uh, you know, algorithms can, can, um, can generate the, the primes up to any, you know, given point if you have enough time. You, you can certainly do this algorithmically, really just by going through it like, like this. Yeah, I mean, so, but of course the thing is you couldn't actually program the computer to do it for everything because it would never terminate, right? But you could program a computer to find all the primes up to, 
you know, whatever, 10,000 or something like that. And it could, should be able to do it very, very quickly, you know. Um, I mean, because, you know, it, it, could, it could just, again, it could just strike out all the evens first, then it goes to the next. I mean, you, you could make it very precise just like this, and it would, it would work for sure. Um, but there are actually more. This is a very naive approach. There are much more efficient ways to do it than this. But this is just kind of give you a background as to kind of, you know, sort of the setup as to where we're going to go from here. This is sort of the primitive, the very primitive level. This guy, you know, this guy is an old, old dead guy now. I mean, you know, I, this is ancient stuff, okay? We're, we're going to get to slightly more modern stuff. But the really modern stuff is, is, hard, is really hard and it's way beyond the scope of this, this course. But we're going to get to some things that are a little bit more efficient. And she had mentioned something, which we're going to talk about in a minute, too. Um, okay, and so, does everybody, well, I've been blabbing now for a while, so I assume you all have this down, right? Okay. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do to kind of introduce the next idea is uh, we're just going to go and look at a very specific problem. And again, this is the kind of problem that you may have seen a while ago um, in elementary school, maybe, is the number 509 prime. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to le sort of lead you into the next result here. Um, solution. So the question I want to want to ask you is, question: um, Must we check? Every. Integer x with um, 1 less than x less than 509 to answer this question. Okay. That's right. That's right. So uh, this was a little bit vague what I'm writing down here, but um, what, what I mean is do we have to check every integer x strictly between 1 and 509 to see if x divides 509, right? Because if there is one, then it's not prime. Do we have to actually check all of those is the question. Um, <clears throat> and the answer is uh, no. And so the first proposition, this is kind of what you both were alluding to. And this is... So this is in the book. I don't know if they actually list it as a proposition, although I want to offset it this way because it's, you know, it's, it's kind of useful. Um, and it's really not hard to prove. Um, first proposition just says that uh, suppose C is bigger than 1 is... a composite integer. Then there is a prime divisor P of C such that P is less than or equal to the square root of C. Okay, I think this is what you were you were uh, asking about before. Okay, so I'll show you why this is true. Okay, so what is before I, I write the proof? What is this really saying? It's saying that okay, well, suppose you have a number you want to check to see if it's prime. Well. If you know it doesn't have any prime of factors less than or equal to the square root of it, then it, then it is prime. Then, in fact, it is prime. So if it were composite, then it would have one. That's what this proposition is saying. <coughs> okay. Do you have to write integer there? Um, like, because composite only applies to That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to be completely clear here. But, yes, it, it's definitely implied by composite. Yeah, it's a little bit redundant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Let's assume that C is composite. Then, okay, there was a lemma I proved about, the, about this. This was, uh, this was the last section we were talking about um, 
the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, and I defined what prime and composite, uh, what these things are, and then I proved something about composite numbers. So if a number is composite, then it can be written as a product of two integers that are strictly between one and itself. Right? This was actually a lemma in your notes from a while back, but this was in the fundamental theorem of arithmetic section, if I remember right. Um, so then C is equal to A times B for some integers A and B. I'll just write it this way. A and B are in Z, satisfying one is less than A is less than C, and one is less than B, which is less than C. Okay, so um, these integers A and B, they compare the, under the natural ordering of the integers. So for sure, either A is less than or equal to B or B is less than or equal to A. One of those is definitely true. They may be equal to each other for all we know, but, but definitely one is less than or equal to the other one. There's no question about that. Right? So. We may assume that A is less than or equal to B. Okay. Now you might say, well, what? If, how do you know that? What if what if B is bigger than or equal to A? Well, that's that's okay. If it is, then we'll just we'll just rename everything and just flip it, everything around. So um, the point is just one of them is less than or equal to the other one. And so since multiplication is commutative, it really doesn't matter which one we take. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to multiply through by uh, A. And so what do we get when we multiply this inequality through by A? Of course, we can do this because A is positive, so we don't have to worry about you know flipping inequality signs and that kind of business. So, a squared then is less than or equal to ab, i.e., a squared is less than or equal to c, right? Because by what we have above, this, this is c, right? I have that up here. Um, c is ab. So, if we just replace ab with c, this is what we get. Everything's positive, right? A and C, um, everything's positive here. So if, if A squared is less than or equal to C, then if we take the square root of both sides, that's legal too. We can, we can do that. We have two positive numbers. One's less than the other. Then their square roots are also the square of the first one's less than or equal to the square root of the other one, right? Okay. So if you want to write this down, I'm just taking the square root of both sides. That's all I'm doing here. Okay. Now this isn't, we haven't actually proved what we want to prove yet though, right? We just proved that A is less than or equal to the square root of C. We need to get a prime divisor, a prime number that uh, divides C that's less than or equal to the square root of C. Okay, um, what we do know is that by the, okay, I, I'm running out of room here. Fundamental theorem of arithmetic, is that okay? Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, okay, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but um, let's, let me finish this here. There is a prime number P um, such that P divides A, right? That's part of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, arithmetic that every integer bigger than one is, can be written as a product of primes. And then there was this uniqueness component, and that took a lot of work to verify. But uh, the easy part is just that there's a prime divisor. <clears throat> okay, and let me, <laughs> I'm going to try to squeeze as much as I can down here. Okay, so if P and A are positive and P divides A, that means that P is definitely less than or equal to A, right? Which is less than or equal to the square root of C. So P is definitely less than or equal to the square root of C. 
Do you all see this? You see, and you can see why p is less than or equal to a, right? Because p is positive and it's a factor of a. There's a, there's a theorem back in 2, 1 or something about this, right? It, something divides something else, then there are absolute values. There's something about it, you know, comparing the absolute values. Well, these are all positive. So if p divides a, then p is certainly less than or equal to it. I mean, it's just every factor, right? If you have all positive, you know, these are all positive. A factor is definitely less than or equal to the number itself, for sure, right? So p is less than or equal to the square root of c. So what is it that we need to, there's still one other thing we have to check in order to finish the proof here. Um, what is it that we actually haven't shown yet? Anybody see this? Yes, that p is actually a divisor of c. Okay, we've got everything else, but we need to check that p is actually a divisor of c. That's not hard. I'll just say it right now, and then I'll write it down. p is a divisor of a, right? p divides a. a divides c. Therefore, p divides c. There's this transitive property. This is somewhere in 2, 1, probably. If a divides b, b divides c, then a divides c. Okay? If you have a number that's a factor of another number, and that number itself is a factor of another, then the first one was a factor. That's not hard to see, really, I don't think. And so that's it. I mean, that's really the end of the proof, then. Uh, let's see. I'm going to be... Oh, I shouldn't do this, but... So we have... Um, let's see. P divides A and A divides C. So P divides C. Okay, I finished it. <laughs> when you're writing on paper, do you... No, 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 no. You would be, you really, honest to God, you would be shocked at how good my writing is on the board. If I was, if I was doing that on the board, you'd be like, wow, I can't believe it's the same guy. Um, but I think uh, this has actually improved a little bit from the very first day. I, th I think it's gotten a little All better. All you have to do is check your genes. Yeah, yeah, right. That's true. Okay, so that's it. That's it. So, point is, if you have a composite number, then it has a prime divisor that is less than or equal to the square root of it. So if there is no prime divisor less than or equal to the square root, then it has to be prime. And so now we can go back to this first problem, and we can answer the question um, much more easily than just plugging everything in from, from you know, 2 to 508 to see if they're factors. We can actually just take the square root and see if any of the primes below that are factors. And if the answer is no, then we know it's prime. Okay. Everybody have this down now? Okay. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's go back to the uh, first problem. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is this. Let's take the square root of 509. This is roughly uh, equal to 22.5. This is an approximation. It's, it's definitely irrational, so it goes on forever. But um, this is all that we really care about right now. The prime numbers less than or equal to okay are and this isn't hard of course you can easily find these two three five seven eleven. 13, 17, and 19. Right? In the book, it would have put like 22 is less than the square yeah. root of 509, and then it would have done 23 also. What's the point of the 23? There's no point. There's no point. No. The author likes to make things unnecessarily complicated for no reason. Um, okay. None of these, you can check this, um, divide 509. This is easily checked. Uh, well, yeah, well, okay, so, I mean, this is not really, this is more, the point of this course is more theoretical, but, you know, course 2 doesn't divide it because 509 is odd, right? 3 doesn't divide it. We may prove this at some point, but um, yes, so you may have learned this a while ago that, it, that uh, you, you take a um, positive integer is divisible by 3 if and only if the sum of the digits is divisible by 3. Maybe some of you have heard of this before. 509, the sum is 14. It's not divisible by 3. So 509 is not divisible by 3. It's certainly not divisible by 5 because it doesn't end in 0 or 5, right? 
Yeah, there, there's a rule for sevens, although in this case, I mean, you can just kind of do it. Just, you know, seven into 509, just do the long division. It goes in seven times, 19 goes twice, and there's a remainder of five, so it doesn't work. And you can do something similar for the rest of them. But, yeah, I mean, really, you can, you can do this in a matter of less than a minute, probably, just to, you know, go through it. Um, so, by, the, uh, by this proposition... Five oh nine is prime. Has to be, right? If it were composite, the proposition says that some prime number less than or equal to the square root of it would divide it, but it doesn't. So it has to be prime. Okay. Now we're going to look at another problem. Most of you have probably seen this before. Maybe a couple of you haven't. I was going to ask the question first, but I'm just going to go straight into the proposition. Um, I already asked it before anyway. So this, the, one of the questions I had that we were going to consider uh, today is how many primes are there, right? And most of you know that the answer is that there are an infinite number of primes. Um, since we're doing number theory, it shouldn't be that shocking that we're, I'm going to write a proof of this for you, even though you may have seen it in discrete. Um, how many of you actually did see this in discrete? Okay, most of, well, maybe not most, but over half of you What's that? I took discrete so long ago. You don't remember? Okay, well, okay. Well, there's at least one person that will benefit from seeing this again. Okay, okay. So, this is, anybody remember who uh, this, uh, so the proof that there are an infinite number of primes is sort of the standard proof who, uh, who this is attributed to? Anyone remember this? Old guy? Uh, <laughs> Just the, yeah, it's uh, Euclid is the um, he usually gets credit for this. Okay. There are, in fact, infinitely many primes. Okay, so I'm going to try to just, I'm just going to squeeze this here on this page, I think. Here's the proof. Uh, before I do write the proof, let me, um, let me say something about why this is kind of a nice result in math. Um, it's not, stop drinking before class. Um, it's not, I, that would be horrible. Uh, I hope that's not true. Um, it's not obvious right away that, that there are an infinite number of primes. And the reason is, if you just kind of think of this naively, just think of all the numbers. Well, okay, th this is kind of naive, but just, you know, imagine you, you just, you know, have all the numbers in a big bag and you pull out a big, huge number with, you know, a thousand digits in it. There's a sense in which it's, you know, maybe likely that it's not prime because you, because you have so many numbers before it that could possibly divide into it, right? So the bigger the numbers get, in some sense you might think that, okay, well, it's less likely that they're going to be prime because there's just too many possible factors uh, below, right? So maybe there's a point that comes where there aren't any more primes. Certainly it's not unreasonable to think that if, you, if you're not really well versed in this stuff, that maybe because there's just so many possibilities that every number after, say some number with 50 billion digits, after that, all, there, there aren't any primes left anymore because there's so many possible divisors before it that in fact one of them actually divides everything after that. But it doesn't, actually that's not the case. So. The fact that there are an infinite number of primes is not totally obvious that this would be the case. And the proof is really nice. It's very short. Um, and again, I know a lot of you have seen this before, but the idea is, is this. It's a proof by contradiction. Um, in fact, there are several di different proofs of this. This is just one of them. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, is a, maybe a mistake, but isn't there a range rule that um, dictates where you can have a prime? Like if you have a, a prime so large, then the, um, if there is a multiple or possible multiple of it or divisors, then it has to be within certain. Oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think I know what you're saying, and, and um, we're going to get to that. I probably won't spend time on this right now, but there, there's definitely some, some, um, some theorems about the distribution of primes, um, and uh, I think this will at least give you kind of an indirect 
kind of answer to what to what you're saying. But I, I'm gonna I'm just gonna hold off on that for for just a minute. But depending on exactly what you mean, yes, you're yes. The answer is sort of yes. Um, let's suppose. by way of contradiction that there are only finitely many. And let's just list them out, okay? There's finitely many, say P1, comma, P2, comma, P3, comma, on down to say P sub n, right? We don't know exactly how many there are, even if we assume there are only finitely many, I mean, we know that there's some, I mean, we just found, I mean, we have a list of primes up here, so we know that it's definitely, there's at least this many, for sure. Um, but it stops at some point, that's the main idea, okay? So n, maybe n's a million, a billion, whatever, but it's just a finite list of primes, and then say after that there aren't any more. Okay, and so here's this, this kind of the standard trick. What we're going to do is we're going to let capital, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, let me just call this M. Okay, let M be P1, P2, multiply together all the way down to Pn, just to be completely clear here because this can be ambiguous, plus 1. Okay, so it's all the primes multiplied together and we're going to add a 1 at the very end. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what can we say about m? Well, of course it's an integer, that's for sure. It's definitely a natural number. Um, m is definitely bigger than 1, right? Because we know there are at least some primes, for sure. I mean, even just tinkering a little bit, even if you know nothing, these are primes, so there's, you know, um, there's at least 8 of them, that's for sure. So this number is definitely, m is definitely bigger than 1, for sure. Maybe, maybe it's nine, but yeah, we're going to show it's not possible, but um, m is bigger than one. So what do we know? Go back to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. What do we know about a natural number that's bigger than one? It can be, it's either prime or it can be written as a product of primes. That, that was part of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, right? And there, again, there was the uniqueness part, but we're not interested in that right now. Point is, we have a, an integer bigger than one. It can be written as a product of primes. When I say product, I mean maybe it's a just one prime, maybe it's prime itself. But there's definitely a prime divisor. That's the, that's the main idea. And this is from the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Okay, so there is some prime divisor of m. Okay, All right. because it's bigger than 1. Well, remember what our assumption is. We're assuming that there are only finally many of them, so these are all of them. I mean, of course, this isn't true, that this is our assumption, right? That these are all the primes. So if there's some prime divisor of m, it has to be among this set, because those are all the primes. We're assuming those are all of them. So m has to be p5 or p100 or whatever. It's got to be one of them, for sure. Right? So, uh, hang on just one second. Um, so this prime, whatever this prime divisor is, it has to be in the set P1, P2, down to Pn. Okay, let's, let's say it is uh, P sub, we don't know what it is, you know, P sub I, say, right? Okay, so this, what was, what was your question? The product, mm -hmm. P1 to Pn, mm -hmm. that's composite? That is, that's definitely composite, yeah. Um, now we're adding one, and you'll see why we're adding one here, that's going to come up in a second, but the point is just all that, all that we care about right now is that this number is bigger than one. 
And so it has a prime divisor. And since these are all the primes, that prime divisor has to be one of, one of these. Okay? So, um, so what do we know? We know 1 pi divides m, right? But we also know that p sub i divides p1, p2, the product all the way down to pn. Okay, I'll pause for just a second about this. Um, well, this just comes from the fact that it's a prime divisor. It has to be one of these guys. This is what I was just saying. But since it's an element in this set, right, it certainly is a factor of this product. If you have a product of a bunch of numbers, just take any number in that product. That's definitely a factor of the whole thing, right? Because you just take it and you just multiply it by the, by the remaining numbers in the product. Okay, right? 2 times 3 times 7 times 9. 7 is definitely a factor of that because it's 7 times 2 times 3 times 9. Okay, that whole product. So, um, is this okay? Does this make sense? Okay, can I go ahead and go to the next page? Okay. Um, so since pi divides m and pi divides this product p1, p2, on down to Pn, we get, this is part of a, um, part of a theorem that I proved for you, but uh, Pi has to divide um, M minus this product. Okay. If a number divides two different numbers, then it's going to divide their sum, their difference. I mean, it's going to divide all of these. And you can, you can get that just by writing it out directly, right? If um, I'll just say this, right? If, if pi times x equals m and pi times y is equal to that, then pi times x minus y is going to be equal to m minus that. It's very easy to just see that directly. Just If you just write it out, I'm not going to do it because it's part of a theorem that I proved for you. But this is definitely the case. But, okay, forget about this period at the end. Go, if you go back to the definition of m, okay, I'm just going to go back one so remember what m is. m is the product plus 1. m is the product plus 1. So just remember that's what it is. Of course, it's in your notes too. So what is the product plus 1 minus the product? It's just equal to 1, right? Here's the period. Okay. Can we have a prime number being a factor of 1? Is 3 a factor of 1? No, of course it's not. The only ones are 1 and minus 1, and those are definitely not prime. So there's your contradiction. You can't have a prime being a factor of 1. 1 and minus 1 are the only ones. So because that's a contradiction, the assumption that there are only finitely many has to be wrong, and so there has to be an infinite number of primes. So this is, um, I'll just use this word. So. This is absurd. That's not the case. No prime divides 1. Thus, there are infinitely many. Okay. So that is Euclid's proof. There are other proofs of this. In fact, there are, there's probably 10 or 12 of these that have you know, shown up over the years. Um, this isn't the only way to do it. But this is, this is kind of the classical way to do it. And it's certainly a fairly straightforward proof. Okay, so what else are we going to do? Um, yeah, so they're going to prove one more proposition. And there's going to be a really quick corollary of that. And that's what we're going to, hopefully I can get this done. Um, so now we're going to talk about the other question about the distribution. This is a kind of a weak result. But the question is, okay, well... Um, you know, say you give me a big number and, you know, say we want to know, okay, well, how many primes are there that are less than or equal to that number? Um, there's something called the prime number theorem, which I don't know if we'll get into in this class or not, but it gives kind of a 
estimate of this. Um, but this is going to be a very crude estimate, but we can actually say a few things about this. Um, so we're going to kind of change gears now, and we're going to, we're going to order, from, from now on, we're going to order uh, the primes. We're going to kind of fix this. Okay, and so what I mean is P sub 1 is going to be the first prime. P sub 2 is going to be the, the second prime. P sub 3 will be the third prime, of course, which is 5 and on down, right? So if I write down, you know, P sub 200, that's just the 200th prime, whatever that happens to be. We don't know what it is necessarily, off, of course, we don't off the top of our heads, but we know there is a 200th prime because we just proved that there is an infinite number, so we never run out of them, right? Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prove this, um, this second proposition. And I'm going to give you a very quick corollary of this. And that's actually all I'm going to do in this uh, in this section. I guess this is not this is proposition two, isn't it? Yeah. Is it three? Three. Oh, oh wow. Okay. I am all right, and I'm just going to be easy. Proposition three. <clears throat> well, okay. Yeah, I think I have to do, disagree with you there. I think it's proposition two. The, we had only had one proposition before that. We had a theorem before that, but there was only one proposition, right? Mm -hmm. There was two propositions? Yeah. There are, in fact, infinite many primes. Oh, I didn't call that a theorem. Okay. I see. Okay. Okay. All right. Got it. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going nuts today. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> you're, I know you're just concerned about me. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. mm. For every positive integer n. Okay. This is going to look kind of weird, I guess. But p sub n is less than or equal to. I'm going to try to make this as clear as I can. Two to the power. 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, you can read that. So remember, I just talked about what this was, right? P sub n is just whatever n is, it's the nth prime. If the n was 7, it would be the seventh prime, right? And this is true for every n. So what this is saying roughly is that, you know, in some sense, the, the, the key, there can't be gaps that are huge, huge, huge gaps, um, that they're somehow bounded by this kind of exponential function in some way. Okay. No, not that I know of anyways, no. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. And this is kind of nice because it puts together a few things that we learned a long time ago. Um, and this is, it's also nice because I'm going to do another induction proof, which, which, um, I think you know a few of you kind of need to get some extra practice seeing some of this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pr proceed in this case by strong induction. Okay, we didn't do as many of these back in chapter one, so now you get a chance to see this again. And this was again the second principle of finite induction. I asked you this on the first exam, right? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let's look at the base case of this. Shouldn't be very hard. The base case is just the assertion that um, that um, p sub one is less than or equal to two to the two to the one minus one, right? I e, what does this reduce to? Okay, well, what is, what's p sub one? Okay, it's equal to two. This is just the assertion that 2 is less than or equal to, and what is this equal to? What, what, what number is that? 2, right? 2 to the first. Right? 1 minus 1 is 0, 2 to the 0 is 1, so the, the right side just becomes 2 to the first. Which, of course, is true. And now we need to do the inductive step. <clears throat> okay. 
So I think, yeah, I, I need to start getting the spacing better on the screen here. But, uh, oops, okay, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Uh, let's see, where am I at? Oh, now I'm screwing it all up. Go down to the little blue circle. The blue circle? Yeah. Down Which, here. down here? That's the middle. Ah, okay. There you go. That's not blue. Okay. That's blue? This color is blue. This is like lavender, purple, something like that. Yeah, sorry, you lose. Um, okay. All right. So you, you guys have this? You guys have this down? Okay. Okay. I can go to the next page. All right. Okay. So here's the inductive step. Inductive step. What we're going to do is we are going to we're going to let n be a natural number, and we're going to assume. I'm just going to write this out explicitly here, so there's no confusion. We're going to assume that uh, p sub one is less than or equal to two to the two to the one minus one. Of course, we already verified that. P sub 2 is less than or equal to 2 to the power 2 squared minus 1 and on down, right? So P sub n is less than or equal to 2 to the power 2 to the n minus 1. Yes? Is it the power of 2 to the n minus 1 or is it 2 to the n minus 1? Oh, okay. So, yeah, you're talking about this power up here, right? Yeah, yeah okay, so the power is, um, oh, 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 sorry, 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 yeah, I, I, uh, I f thank you, I, uh, I, I screwed that up, okay, yeah, it's, it should be up here, yeah, it should be up here, sorry about that, minus one, okay, yeah, thank you for that, that would have really screwed the proof up, okay. Everybody clear on this? All right. It's just what I had written before on the on the previous page. I just I just screwed up the the spacing. Okay. So what is it that we need to prove? Um, we will show. We've got to show this is true for n plus one, right? So we're going to show that p sub n plus one is less than or equal to two to the power two to the n plus 1 minus 1, right? Which, of course, simplifies to just, I mean, the part in parentheses simplifies to just 2 to the n, right, in the top. Okay. <clears throat> and so here's, here's what we're going to do. And this does require a little bit of work. So this is going to be very similar to the proof that we, we did that there are an infinite number of primes. So we're going to consider the number P1, P2, P3, you know, on down to Pn. And then I'm not going to put the parentheses in this time, plus 1. Okay, so this is kind of like what we did right in the, the proof of the last theorem. Um, we're going to let... P sub j be uh, any prime divisor okay I want to be very clear about this j now We've used subscripts before just as dummy variables. This J literally means uh, we're, we're staying with this notation that I introduced on the previous slide with the ordering. So what I mean here when I say P sub J, I mean the Jth prime, right? It's not just some, some prime. The J actually means that it's the Jth one from, as we go in order, okay? It certainly has some prime divisors, bigger than one, so there's something. But the J does, does represent the order here, too. Um, okay. Here's, and I'm, I'm going to have to kind of gloss over this a little bit. I'm just going to have to say it because we're going to run out of time here. But um, what can we say about this index J? Well, here's my question. Can J possibly be 1? In other words, can this prime be P sub 1? 
Well, if it was, if the, if it was, then p sub one would divide this, but it also divides this, so it would divide one by just what we did in the last proof. So it can't be p sub one because it would divide, it would then be a factor of one, which it can't be. Similarly, it can't be three because if it were, it would divide this and it would divide this, and so again, it would divide one. So the point is that j has to be bigger than n. Has to be. Can't be any of these guys because you get the, that contradiction we got in the last proof that it would have to be a factor of one. Okay, so um, j has to be bigger than or equal to n plus 1. Okay, so I'll just call this um, equation 1, I guess, or inequality 1. Okay, I'm going to say I'm, there's another part of this inequality which I'm going to get to. If I don't finish this now, I'll finish this up on Tuesday. By the way, this is not, you're, you're not going to really need this, um, the rest of this in order to be able to do the homework. So that's it's not really going to affect your, your homework anyways. Plus it's not due until next Thursday. But um, why is this true? Well, okay, this is just, it just comes from, from this, really. It's just that. If j is bigger than or equal to n plus 1, well, what is, what is p sub j and what's p sub n plus 1? p sub n plus 1 is the n plus first prime. p sub j is the jth prime. If j is bigger than or equal to n plus 1, then that means that p sub j, the jth prime, of course, is farther down the list than the n plus first prime, right? So the n plus first prime is smaller than p sub j, right? Just think about it, right? The second prime is certainly smaller than the third prime because that's how we, we've got them ordered. Okay, so if we know that j is bigger than or equal to n plus 1, then p sub j is bigger than or equal to p sub n plus 1. Okay, and what can we say about p sub j? Well, p sub j is, since it's a factor, is definitely less than or equal to p1, p2, p3, on down to pn, and then plus 1 on the outside. So, just to make this totally clear, we know that p sub n plus 1 is definitely less than or equal to this, right? You guys buy that? Transitivity, right? One thing is less than or equal to something, which is less than or equal to something. That first thing has to be less than or equal to the third thing, right? For sure. So. Okay, um, I think what I'm going to do at this point, I'm going to make a note here. I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop at this point for today. Otherwise, I'm just going to get stuck in the middle of something, and I don't want to do that. So this is where we will end. Um, I'm going to still give you the homework. And uh, here's what I'm going to tell you. The assignment you just turned in, because of there not being class on Tuesday and because I wasn't really available as much, I am going to award you more completion points for this than I would have otherwise done. Okay? I'm still going to grade some, but you, you'll get, I'll give you a little bit of a break on this assignment as a result of that. Okay? Um, and then some, a few of these problems, um, a couple of them are going to definitely require a little bit of thought, um, but I still think you're going to find that this assignment is not quite as bad as uh, the last one was. And um, again, on Tuesday, we'll spend some time. We'll talk about some of these. So you'll still have a couple of days to finish the assignment. Up. I'm not giving you that many problems. Um, one, three, four, just part A, seven, nine B, and 12 C. So you only have six problems. And you've got a week to work on these. OK. Um, OK, so just to remind you, Tuesday, I do recommend that you come to class. We'll, we'll review what little we've done since the last exam. Um, I'll give you again an idea of kind of the things to be looking at. Remind you that one of the problems will come up directly off the second test, right? Um, I'll have this homework assignment back to you so you have all your homework before the exam. Um, and so just, just to be clear, this is probably something else I should say. Don't leave just yet because I'm going to pass your homework back, okay? Um, let me let you know what sections are going to be on the test, right? You might want to know that. Um, so we finished off with 
if I remember, yeah, so the first test covered up through section, um, let's see, where were we at here? So, uh, section 2-3. Two, 2-3, three. Two, three. yeah. And so what we did after that, we did um, 2.4, it's called the Euclidean algorithm. In the lecture, I just called it, I think, GCD and LCM is all I said because I didn't actually cover the Euclidean algorithm. So 2.4, and then um, we skipped 2.5. And then we just went to three, chapter 3, so it's going to just be 2.4, 3.1, 3.2. That's it. That's it. Okay? You don't have a ton of stuff, really. Um, so you definitely want to be looking over that. Um, I will have the solutions to this homework that I'm passing back will be posted uh, this, this afternoon or early evening. So you'll have... They'll, well, no, they're just going to be the ones that were graded. So I'm not going to write out the ones to the other ones, but of course you're always welcome to come and talk to me or ask me and I can tell you, but yeah. Okay, so let me go ahead and turn this off and let me pass these back to you.